Matthew chapter 18. If you don't have a Bible, if you raise your hand, somebody will grab you one. We've made it as far as about verse 21. Last week we were looking as Jesus instructed uh, us to take care of our own personal issues. I was saying last week how the Bible teaches us that um, we are to forgive the sinners, we are to cast out the scoffers and the troublemakers, and we are to deal with our own personal issues. But so many times the church, you know, because we're a bunch of sinners, you know, we, we try to cast out the sinners. We try to hang on to those people that are the troublemakers. And we never deal with personal issues. And that's a, that's a problem. So anyway, as, as Jesus is going through this thing, Peter pipes up. And he says in verse 21, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother? How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? I guess I should read the text, right? <laughs> up to seven times? And Peter's being quite generous here. You know, the culture, nothing like seven times. I, I, I look at this, you know, should I forgive him seven times? And we all kind of smirk at that because we know what it's about to say. <laughs> oh, Peter, not even close, you know. But many of us haven't even gone this far in our personal lives. We haven't even gone seven times. We've been abused by someone. We've been bad-mouthed. We've been taken advantage of. Even if it's just once sometimes. And we hold that grudge. We exclude them. We, we smolder on the inside. You know, got that little fire burning. Oh, that guy. Oh, that person. Oh, my dad. You know, if I ever get, you know. Yeah. Imagine if someone hurt you, really took advantage of you, and then comes like a year later and says, oh, would you please forgive me? And then two months later turns around and does the exact same thing to you. <laughs> we would run to that Italian proverb, would we not? Right, Nancy? Right? Wouldn't we run right here? Fool me once. Shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, because I let you back in. Oh, I'm sorry, Peter's saying, nope, going to forget the Italian thing. I'm going to go for like seven times. But we've been taught in our culture, we've been taught by the world, and you should remember who's teaching you this. We've been taught by the world, Protect yourself at all costs. Don't let them in again. You know, it'll just hurt you. So Peter says, Lord, I want to be more like you. Because I see the Pharisees and the Sadducees and these religious leaders coming to you over and over and over again. And they are picking away at you. And they are trying to get you to fall and trying to get you to trip up. And they are seeking to destroy you. And you welcome them back every day time <laughs> so in verse 22 we all know what this says don't we we could almost quote this right how many times <laughs> Jesus says to him I do not say to you up to seven times but up to 70 times seven 490 times are we to be keeping track Here's the, here's the interesting thing. God of the Old Testament, under the law, when the people were under the law, God kept track. I don't know if you realize this. Israel, he, he set them up in their land and he gave them 490 years in their land and not once did they keep their Sabbath year. Not once did they lay their land fallow and allow, you know, that Sabbath rest for the land to take place. So you know what he did at the end of 490 years? He took them captive to Babylon 
For how long? 70 years. All the 70 years that they didn't allow the Sabbath, he, he got his land's Sabbath back. But God is now transitioning. Jesus is now transitioning the people from the law to the New Testament. From the law to grace. And what he's doing is he says, I want you to look at these offenses against you with a different heart. I'm not instructing you to keep your little log book. That's 487. That's four, you know. No, don't keep records of wrongs. Put it way out there. Who cares? Because that isn't what matters. I told you to become like little children. Little children don't hold many grudges. Have you noticed? Their friend hits them with the toy and they run off and they cry and they come back and the little kid goes, you want to come play cars with me? Yep. Right back over, right? Guess what? They could get hit with a toy again. It's okay. Kids don't think, kids don't going in, don't go into a situation thinking that the other person is going to hurt them. They give them the benefit of the doubt. And when they get hurt, they understand it's part of growing up. It's part of being a kid. It's going to hurt. I want to look at a couple of New Testament verses that deal with this issue. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, you guys all know it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our... Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our harm. Forgive us our stuff as we forgive them. That's an interesting prayer. That should be part, almost part of everybody's daily prayer. <laughs> Lord, forgive me the same way I forgive others. And some of us are immediately in trouble when we read that, when we think that. Well, that hasn't gone very well, you know. Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. But Mark, you, you don't understand what's gone on. You don't know the hurt and the pain. You don't know. And, and you're absolutely right. I don't know. But God does. <laughs> and this is his heart for you, that you would forgive. And here's why. Because unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping they die. Does that work for you? Because if I drink poison, I die. Not them. <sighs> You're really just killing yourself by hanging on to this thing. You're tearing your own self up. You're empowering that person to control you. Do you know that? They're stealing some time. They're stealing your happiness. They're stealing your joy. They're stealing from you, and you're allowing it. All that love and joy and peace we're supposed to be walking in, they're plucking that out of your life. <laughs> Look at what I'm doing. The more you forgive, the easier it is to forgive. And the more free you become. Luke talked about this in Luke chapter 17. He says, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Go to him, talk to him, tell him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes to you and says, oh man, I'm so sorry, I blew it again. You shall forgive him. <laughs> seven times in the same day. We, we walk through one, you know, a year. And then, you know, 
seven times in the same day. And in, and in Luke's gospel, it's the same sin. He gets up in the morning. And while you're eating your Rice Krispies, you know, he does whatever he does. And he comes to you an hour later. I'm sorry, so, so blew it. And 10 minutes later, he does the exact same thing. And then at lunch, he does the exact same thing. And then at 1 o'clock, he does the exact same thing. Seven times in one day. And the Lord's words, forgive him. That's unbelievable that God would ask that of us, isn't it? It's, it's like it's an impossible goal. And it is without the Holy Spirit in your life. Without giving up this. Without doing what Jesus said. If anyone wants to follow after me, deny self. Lay this thing down. <laughs> I think about some of my days with the Lord, even since I've been saved. If he sins against you seven times in one day, I wonder how many days I have done that to my Lord. Oh, mercy. And yet he has freely forgiven me, undeservedly forgiven me. Because I ask. And he did it every time I ask. There's also long consequences to you hanging on to someone else's sin. It says in John chapter 20, verse 21, So Jesus said to them, again, peace be to you. He's talking to the disciples. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So he is empowering them. Right? If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Do you understand what that just said? I don't want to get to heaven and find out that my retaining of this guy's thing that he did to me didn't allow him into the kingdom because his sins were still on him. <laughs> my anger kept someone from Jesus. My anger, my grievance, my hard heart kept someone else out. Some of you guys, this is a stretch, right? You've been hurt. And what you must do is you must come into your mind, what would you think if that person actually got saved? Fell in love with Jesus. I mean, just became a radical Jesus freak. What, what would you think? Because when you become radical for Jesus, <laughs> Not only are you forgiven and set free, but then you begin to take on the mind and the heart and the life of Christ. It's not the same one that hurt you. They're now free. They're now amazing, you know? Would you still be unloving, unforgiving towards that person? Well, you may have to Im imagine them saved. Imagine them, what God is about to do. You've gained a father back. You've gained a brother or a sister or a friend back because you've given it up. In Romans 12, it says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Oh, man, there's some hard words in this Bible. And it's not just that they're words. We love Jesus. We want to follow him. This is what it looks like. Romans 12, 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him a drink. 
And in so doing, you will heap coals of fire upon his head. Now, don't play with that much in your mind. That's God's job, not yours. Here's how it ends. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's our life. That's us. This forgiveness thing is a huge thing in Christianity. <laughs> We're not to hold on to our rights to feel like we've been abused. Not to hold on your right to a grudge or to a, you know, whatever. Your feelings, your emotions, your little hurts. I'm sorry. I've been bought with a price. I am not my own. I belong to Christ, and I must obey Him now, not my feelings, not my emotions, not my pain. So in, in verse 23, Jesus says this, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But he was not able to pay his master, and he commanded that he should be sold with his wife and with his children all that he had that payment might be made. Jesus here, remember what he's talking about, forgiveness. Remember what he's talking about, dealing with personal issues. So he begins this story. A king decided it was account settling day. You might think about this as judgment day. Everything's called up this day. <sighs> and one was brought to him owing 10,000 talents. Now a talent, a biblical talent is somewhere between 75 and 100 pounds of whatever it was, gold, silver, that kind of thing. So I was checking the gold prices, you know, because I got a lot of it. So I was checking it the other day. And the gold is uh, $1,461 an ounce. $17,532 a pound. $1,753,200 a talent. Don't get carried away there. He's not talking about money. He's talking about a debt that is owed unforgiveness. He's talking about a debt that is owed, you know, the cost of our sin. That's what he's talking about. <laughs> this man owed the king more than he could ever repay. Think about that. I've just got $10,000 million to pay back. You know, no big deal, right? Make that next week. Be like Manny. I'll make more next week. It'll be all right. And the king's decree? Sell him. Sell his wife. Sell his kids. Sell everything he's got so I might get something out of this deal. In verse 26... I got to get to verse 26. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. The servant, now understanding, realizing his debt, he says, You know, he falls before the king. I like that. He knows who the king is. Have patience with me, I will repay. How? You ever ask yourself that? How am I ever going to repay this? <laughs> we'll see his scheme in a minute or two, but how? How's he ever going to repay this? But the king, our king, our king, answers just this amazing way. You might have this in the back of your mind. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. The king, in verse 27, says, Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. The king moved with compassion. 
God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but would have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn them, to hold them accountable for their debt, but that the world through him might be saved, might be freed. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who believes has no more debt. But he who does not believe is condemned already. His debt is already on his account. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Our amazing King, our God, who saw our debt and saw our absolute inability to pay it. <laughs> you might ask, well, what debt? Well, our sin. And our sin is like owing 10,000 talents of whatever it is to the king, to your master. We are sinners by birth. We inherited it from Adam. And we are sinners by choice every single day of our lives. And as sinners, we are infected. We are corrupted. <laughs> We're covered in sin and wickedness, and there's no way to get out of it. You know, I liken it to glitter. <laughs> sin is like glitter. Right? You come into the world and you don't have any glitter on you. You know? Maybe just a little you rubbed off on mom as you got out, you know? And then as you go through life, what you've got to understand is we live in a fallen world. It's covered in glitter. And you're making choices that cover you in glitter. And next thing you know, you're full of glitter. And everywhere you go, and everything you touch, and every place you've been, glitter, 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 glitter. I mean, I wanted to use something cool like, you know, grease. You ever been out working on your truck, you know, or your car or whatever, and you get, you get some of that wheel bearing grease, you know, the black stuff on you. <laughs> and the next thing you know, you know, your wife brings you out a sandwich and now it's on the plate, it's on the bread. It's everywhere. It just gets everywhere. We try to wash it off in this world, but the world has been corrupted by our sin also. You know, Romans chapter 8 says, it suffered the fall just like you suffered the fall. There is stuff in this world that will kill you. Yeah, how'd that get there? The fall. Same way you got sin in you. We try to wash it off, but the cleaners of this world, they're full of that stuff too. And at the time our king decides, okay, it's settle up day. You know, we and whatever we have ever touched come to him glittered up, corrupt. Nobody wants that stuff, you know. So our, our debt is huge, huge. Some say, well, Mark, you're wrong. I, I believe people can actually clean their own lives up. I think they can get right. God's word is really clear. In Romans chapter 3, it says this, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seek after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There are none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their way, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And then it goes on to say this. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. 
By the time you read through that, you should just sit there in your chair and go, it is hopeless. I got no way. I got no way to get there. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. Therefore, by doing things, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. As soon as you bring up a law, all the knowledge of that sin comes into your brain. 55 miles an hour. That's all I need to say. You know, 70 miles an hour. Oh, I'm going to push it a little today. You know, All our good works, all our greatest efforts are like filthy rags, the Bible says. Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses, all these works that we think we're doing, those righteousnesses, they are filthy rags. It's been contaminated by us. Glitter is everywhere. Some imagine themselves bringing a silver platter of their good works to the Lord on Judgment Day. Lord, look at all this stuff I've done for you. And well, when you study Isaiah 64 and you look into that passage and you, you look at the Hebrew, filthy rags is a disgusting picture. It's used menstrual cloths. You're going to pile those up on a silver platter and take them to the Lord? Look at what I've done for you, Lord. We are all this man. Every one of us is this man who owes an unpayable debt to our master. But we have a savior who paid a debt he didn't owe. Because we had a debt we couldn't pay. He was moved with compassion. <laughs> and notice, he doesn't just say, okay, I'll give you more time to pay it off. Like this guy was asking for. He doesn't say that. He says, you're forgiven. You're set free. You were in bondage. You were in slavery. I sold you to the prison. No, I, I broke you out of that place. I have now set you free. And you have no debt with me. <laughs> Why? Because we're his favorite? Oh, he chose me because I'm the cutest, I'm the brightest, I'm his special one. Nope. It's because he is good, period. If this man would have just stopped right there and just received what he was given, boy, the, the message would have been great. But no, he's a lot like us. It says in verse 28, But that servant, who was forgiven, who was set free, went out and found one of his fellow servants, others, who owed him a hundred denarii. And he took him by the hand, or he, he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, and said, Pay me what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. He goes out, and here's this guy who, had, who owes him something. And it's a considerable sum. 100 denarii is 100 days' wages. $10,000 worth of debt. And he says, Pay up right now, because today's your judgment day. Hard words from someone who's just been freely forgiven, isn't it? <laughs> and what fascinates me is in verse 29, this is the exact phrase that the forgiven one asked his Lord with and was forgiven. This guy's asking the same mercy, asking the same grace, and doesn't get it. In verse 30, but he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay all 
the debt. This guy has no compassion. This guy has no love. This guy has no feelings whatsoever to this other guy's situation. I will not forgive. I will not care. I will not change my heart towards this guy. Now, what's interesting, fascinating, both of these guys are servants of their master. The master takes care of all their basic needs, food, housing, shelter, clothing, all of that stuff. Their basic needs are met by the king because they have a job. But he's not satisfied with the basic needs. He's got greed. He's got desires. I want my pound of flesh from this guy. He's not learned that godliness with contentment is great gain. So he threw this man into prison and said, now pay me everything you owe me. How's he going to pay him? He can't even work now he's in prison. And that's what happens with us when we throw somebody that's offended us into prison. We put them in little Facebook timeout. You know, we put them into little, you know, hard-hearted little compartment over here. And we do not allow them the freedom to pay us back. We don't allow them the ability to make it right. We demand payment. We lock them away. And it makes no sense whatsoever that we do it. The other thing this guy is doing, and you need to take note of this, is this guy is interrupting the flow of grace and forgiveness. The king, because of his little plea, oh, please have mercy on me, boom, forgives him, settles everything. And this guy stops that flow. Now, in Israel, there's this river. It's the Jordan River. You guys are familiar with it. It goes north to south, flows all the way through the country. And I picture that like grace. Grace, forgiveness, the Lord's blessing flowing through the land. And it flows into this lake, this big lake called Galilee. Sea of Galilee. And it flows in there, and Galilee is teeming with life. Fish and birds and clean water. And it's just, it's glorious, beautiful in this place. And it also gives out abundantly, because at the south end of that, the Jordan River continues. As much as it receives, it spills out the other way. <laughs> But then it flows into another lake, another big body, which takes in everything it's given, but doesn't give away a single drop. We call that the Dead Sea. It's a salt sea. From a distance, it looks promising. Ooh, water out in the middle of the desert, that's cool. And then you get there, and there's crusty old salt encrusted on everything. It's dead. It's unlivable. There is no life whatsoever in that place. Why? Because it willingly received. It just is unwilling to give. And I find that a very interesting picture. It's harsh. It's unloving. It's unmoving. And it's it's corrupting. You drop something by the, by the Dead Sea, and you come back a week later and it's covered in salt. It's absolutely covered. What a picture of, that is of this man, this unforgiving, forgiven one. Of you and me, who have received freely so much from the Lord, and yet we still hold on to these little things. We think that guy's got to earn it. <sighs> he should at least have to go do this. Come and tell me face to face, whatever it is, you know. We, we, we walk through those things. We hold it all in. And what is meant to bring life and joy and wonder and beauty <laughs> brings death. It makes you a crusty old individual. Right? We become bitter 
We become impenetrable. You can almost walk across the Sea of Galilee. When you, when you lay down your body in the Sea of Galilee, only this much goes into the water. Only just a little skim of you. It's impenetrable. Your heart can no longer be penetrated. Everything floats on the surface. Jesus had told his disciples before, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper for your money belts, nor bag for your beauty, for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. Don't get caught up in the I deserve this. It's going to require that. Trust the king to be your supply and go do your job in the kingdom, which is what grace have you received? Put that grace back out there. Give it away. But he would not. So he throws this guy into prison. In verse 31, So when his fellow servant saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Your fellow servants. <laughs> the rest of us, you know, kids of the king, you know, we see things, we're affected by other people, and you know what we do with those things? We fall on our knees and we tell our king, Lord, this is going on. Lord, I saw that. Lord, would you work in this situation? <laughs> then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant. Oh God, I pray we never hear those words from that mouth. I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? I forgave you all your debt. The, the Greek word for all? All. Right? Think of the load of debt we have laid there at Christ's cross. All of those heinous, gross sins that we used to kind of laugh at and kind of get excited about. The really ugly ones. Think about the little ones. Think about the deeds and the lies and the whispers and the thefts, the accusations and the gossip. Think about the hard-heartedness, the selfishness, the greed, the lusts, and the unforgiveness that is in us. Oh, praise Jesus, our King, for having compassion on us, right? Should you not have had compassion... I gave you compassion should that have not been infecting you. <laughs> should not Christ's love become our love? Should not his heart become our heart? Should not his mind become our minds? Should not compassion flow through us? You know, I used to read the Bible and I would always think every time it talked about a vessel, I was like a gold cup, you know? Uh, actually, I'm an old, crusty, yucky cup, but it's covered with gold now. It's all made righteous. And he would pour me full. And then my wife, my sweet little wife, she goes, well, that's an okay picture of a vessel, but I think God's talking about like a blood vessel where life can flow through you to everything else. And I'm like, oh, never really thought about that. And I'm a shallow mind kind of a guy, you know. We're to bring life, we're to bring forgiveness, we're to bring love, compassion, you know, everywhere we go. Have you received any grace from God? Can I just ask that? You know, I was reading Philippians chapter 2, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, you get any consolation from Christ? If there is any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any 
affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but for the interests of others. We are to give as we have received. And I just got to tell you, just from my heart, I live the most blessed life imaginable. I, I mean, I can't imagine anybody out there having a better life, have happiness, have great kids. I'm surrounded with family and my wife. And I just, it's, it's amazing where God has brought me. And I know I'm not alone. So many of us were scoundrels, you know. We were the worst of the worst. And now God is blessing us and we're just like, where's all this coming? I don't deserve this. Where that? Why me? Jesus, looking at this guy, should you not have done what was done for you? Verse 34, and his master was angry. Well, again, Imagine God being angry. And delivered him to the torturers. I don't like that word. Until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father will do to each of you who from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. His master is angry. That word, I've looked it up, means angry. You know? And he personally delivers him to the torturers, to the place of torment. Do you get the picture, Gehenna? Hell? Until he should pay it all, but once you're in that place, you have no ability to pay. That's why the place of torment is an eternal place of torment. But he says in verse 35, wake up, guys, this is a real story. This is real life. This is exactly what is going to happen to you and to me if we fail to forgive, to deal with our debts. <laughs> the first debt we owe is to our king, it's to our master, it's to our God. And that debt is unpayable by you and me. The only way it can be paid is to run to him, fall on your knees, and beg for mercy. And guess what you will receive? Mercy, forgiveness. And then our second debt is to each other. You've been wronged, and you've wronged. You've been offended, and you've offended. You've been abused, and abused. <laughs> Right? We're on both sides of this thing. We must forgive. Notice the word must. Now, forgiveness is not easy. It's very simple. It is not easy. Here's the basics. Go fall on your knees. You might just start by asking God, God, would you make me willing to forgive this person, right? I mean, that's a great place to start. You might just start praying for that person because you cannot pray for someone over a week or two week period of time and not have your heart go out to that person. That will begin to change you. But the best thing you can do is to run to the Father, fall on your knees, and beg him for, to forgive you for not forgiving them. Oh, God, how wrong I am and how much more I need your forgiveness. And, Lord, let's just sweep that under. Let's get rid of that. Bring them before him in prayer and say from your heart, Father, I forgive them. This is what they did. I no longer put it on their account. Because you no longer hold my account against me. Freely I have received, freely I'm gonna give back. 
you know, you might do it like this. Father, I forgive them. God, help my unforgiveness, <laughs> right? <laughs> we need to grow in long-suffering. I need to be conformed more into the image of Christ. God, free me from the bondage that I'm putting myself in by not forgiving others. Because, Lord, I'm hanging on to all of this temporary stuff that really doesn't matter. And I'm letting it bind me up. Lord, free me and free them. And not only forgive me, and not only forgive them, but then God bless them. Grace them. Lord, that they might also become like you. <laughs> become their father. Become their master. Become their Lord. Become their savior. What a difference this world would be. And God, help me to be obedient, not to pick that thing back up but to lay it down day after day after day. Take up my cross and follow you daily. Let me not be overcome with evil, but let me overcome evil with good. Father, as I, um, as I think through this passage, Lord, I've met many, 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 many who struggle with forgiveness. And Lord, it's this simple truth. They don't understand the freedom that forgiving that person brings. Not necessarily to the other, but to them, to their heart, to their emotions, to their, you know, to their lives. Lord, I was thinking through this week, Lord, is there anybody? Lord, I, I can't think of anybody since like, uh, you know, ninth grade. I remember this kid, he really ticked me off. And I held on to that. I remember a, a dentist that blew it with me and I held on to that for a while. But Lord, you have so cleansed that idea from my heart. And Lord, now all I can see, all I can think is God that you would save them that they would become a brother or a sister or a father or a mother and Lord, just a person after your own heart. God, deal with us. Lord, awaken us to your desire that we would not interrupt the flow of grace, the flow of forgiveness, the flow of love. We wouldn't become a Dead Sea, but God, we would become a Galilee, abundant life. Lord, that is what we seek, and that is what we pray for. In Jesus' name, amen.